Good afternoon. Can I remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn when moving around the Chamber and across the Holyrood campus? The first item of business is a statement by Nicola Sturgeon on COVID-19 update. The First Minister will take questions at the end of her statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Nicola Sturgeon, First Minister. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. I will set out the Cabinet's decision on the timescale for converting the legal requirement to wear face coverings in certain indoor settings into guidance. Uh, firstly, though, and to set the context for that decision, I will give a brief update on the current COVID situation. Uh, the most recent ONS COVID infection survey for the week ending 20th March indicated that one in 11 people in Scotland had COVID. That is the highest level of infection so far recorded by this weekly survey, and it does reflect the impact of the highly infectious BA2 subvariant of the virus. The daily case numbers also show a very high, though perhaps stabilising, level of infection. Today, 9,610 new cases identified through a PCR or a lateral flow test will be reported. Uh, again, though, it is important to set these figures in some context. Two weeks ago, there were, on average, just over 12,400 new cases being reported each day. One week ago, the average case number was still high at around 12,000 a day. But over the past week, it has fallen to 10,200 a day, which is a 15 per cent reduction in the past seven days. And the reduction is fairly consistent across all age groups. So that does give us grounds for optimism that this latest wave of infection may now have peaked. Of course, the daily numbers on their own need to be treated with a degree of caution. But the result of wastewater sampling, which is an important strand of our ongoing surveillance, also gives some cause for optimism. It is not yet indicating a fall in the level of infection, but it does suggest that the situation has stabilised since mid-March. We will therefore continue to assess the data closely, including, of course, the results of the latest ONS survey, which are due later this week. But we are hopeful that this wave has peaked or is now peaking. Indeed, this is being observed already in Northern Ireland, which, unlike England and Wales, appears to have been ahead of Scotland in the transmission of BA2. Although the BA2 variant is highly infectious, indeed more so than the original Omicron variant, it is important to stress that vaccination continues to provide strong protection against serious illness, uh, which of course underlines the importance of getting all doses of vaccines that we are offered. The programme of additional boosters for certain groups started three weeks ago in older people's care homes and from last week appointments are being offered to everyone aged 75 and over. People with suppressed immune systems will have appointments for additional boosters scheduled during spring and summer starting from the 18th of April and appointment letters will be issued by post. Anyone who is unsure about eligibility for an additional booster should of course contact their doctor for advice. In addition, the vaccination programme for 5 to 11 year olds is underway. Children in that age group with specific medical conditions and those who are household contacts of someone who is immunosuppressed were already being vaccinated in line with JCVI advice. Uh, vaccination of the wider 5 to 11 year old age group started on the 19th of March and that will continue over coming weeks. Older children are being given appointments first, but families are being invited to get vaccinated together whenever that is possible. Obviously, with case rates being as high as they've been recently, some young people who are invited for a vaccine will recently have had COVID. So I want to briefly summarise uh, the guidelines for those circumstances. Those aged 5 to 17 who have specific medical conditions or who are household contacts of someone who is immunosuppressed should wait four weeks after first testing positive or from the onset of symptoms before being vaccinated. And four weeks is also the recommended gap for adults who get the virus. All others aged 5 to 17 should wait 12 weeks after having the virus before being vaccinated. Uh, parents or carers of children who have been unable to be vaccinated due to having COVID it should call the helpline on 0800 0308013 to reschedule appointments uh, when that is necessary. Uh, the advice to everyone, of course, remains as important as ever. Please do take the opportunity to get vaccinated as soon as you are able and make sure you get all doses of the vaccine that you are eligible for. 
Uh, this remains the most important thing any of us can do to protect ourselves and others, and of course it is never too late to get vaccinated. Despite the effectiveness of vaccination, the high level of infection has put the National Health Service under even more severe strain in recent weeks. We are seeing the impact of that in all parts of the NHS, not least in our accident and emergency services. The number of people in hospital with COVID uh, reported today, 2,344. Um, is, I'm pleased to say, 39 uh, fewer than the number yesterday. Uh, but yesterday's figure was the highest it had been since the start of the pandemic. So today's number is still exceptionally high, and it is significantly above the previous peak of hospital cases, uh, which was 2053 back in January 2021. Uh, more positively, and again, this is evidence of the power of vaccination, the number of patients in intensive care with COVID remains relatively low at 26 on today's figures, which is a fall of 15 in the past two weeks. Nevertheless, the volume of people in hospital with COVID is causing very significant pressure for a health service that has been dealing with the pandemic for more than two years now. Uh, that means we cannot be complacent and shouldn't be complacent uh, for the period up until Easter. Therefore, we are continuing to ask everyone uh, to take a lateral flow test twice a week, to take a test daily for seven days if you are a close contact of someone who has tested positive, and to take a test before visiting someone who is vulnerable. If you have symptoms, you should continue to get a PCR test either at a testing site or by post. And if you test positive, you should isolate and follow the advice from Test and Protect. Using the approach set out a few weeks ago in the revised strategic framework and based on the government's clinical advice, our assessment is that the virus at this stage continues to present a medium threat. However, we do remain optimistic that it will move to being a low threat during the course of the spring. Uh, we have, of course, already largely moved away from reliance on legally imposed protective measures and are now relying instead on vaccines, treatments and sensible public health behaviours and adaptations. Indeed, nine days ago, we lifted all bar one of the remaining COVID legal requirements. Uh, however, we did at that point retain in law the requirement to wear face coverings on public transport and in certain indoor settings. I said two weeks ago that we would review this requirement before the Easter recess, which we have now done. Uh, we have taken account of the very high level of infection and the pressure on the NHS, and also the fact that face coverings do provide an important layer of protection against transmission of the virus from one person to another. However, we are also mindful that the data may now be indicating a peaking of this wave of infection, which should hopefully become more pronounced over the next couple of weeks. Uh, we have therefore concluded, subject as always to the state of the pandemic, that the legal requirement to wear face coverings uh, will be replaced with guidance on the following phased basis. From next Monday, 4th April, it will no longer be a legal requirement to wear a face covering in places of worship or while attending a marriage ceremony, a civil partnership registration or a funeral service or commemorative event. And then the wider legal requirements applying to shops, certain other indoor settings and public transport will be converted to guidance two weeks later on the 18th of April. Uh, we will, of course, continue to encourage the wearing of face coverings in certain indoor places, especially where significant numbers of people are present. This phased approach strikes, I think, a sensible balance between our desire to remove this one remaining legal measure and the common sense need for continued caution, not least for the sake of the NHS, while this wave of infection does subside. I recognise that face coverings are an inconvenience. However, given all the sacrifice of the past two years and in view of the current pressure on the NHS, I believe the vast majority of people will accept that for a further two weeks, this is a proportionate precautionary measure while we pass the peak of this latest wave. It also, of course, provides some additional protection to those who are more at most at risk from the virus. Uh, presenting officer, in conclusion, I want to take this opportunity again today to thank the public for the patience and the responsibility that continues to be demonstrated by the overwhelming majority of people across the country. Uh, life has returned to normal for most of us, but COVID hasn't gone away. Indeed, there will be very few of us in recent weeks who have been untouched by this virus, either ourselves or within 
our families or networks of colleagues. Uh, that in itself is a sign of how infectious the virus continues to be. So while the level of infection remains as high as it is, uh, I would ask people to continue, please, to take sensible, basic steps in order to protect yourselves and others. Thank you. The First Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. I would be grateful if members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. This week, the number of people in Scotland waiting four hours at accident and emergency reached the worst level since records began. More people are waiting longer for cancer treatment than at any point since 2008. People with critical conditions and others with potentially terminal illnesses are not getting the treatment they need and deserve quickly enough. The pandemic has made things worse, but the First Minister cannot get away with just blaming COVID. So can she set out the specific actions that her government will take now to address these feelings and ensure people in Scotland get the treatment they need when they need it? Turning to COVID, uh, case rates here are now far higher than anywhere in the United Kingdom. The First Minister's strategy is clearly failing. And because of her failing strategy, she's keeping restrictions in place here in Scotland weeks after they've been removed elsewhere. Yeah. Countries across the UK and Europe have already removed restrictions and are living with COVID. But today, the First Minister has signalled that face masks will continue for several more weeks. Now, we believe that anyone who wants to keep wearing a face mask should keep doing so, particularly if that will help vulnerable friends and relatives. But it should be down to individual choice, as it is in other parts of the United Kingdom. We should leave it up to people and businesses to decide what is best for them, based on public health advice. Nicola Sturgeon has to start trusting the people of Scotland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This just is not an inconvenience. It is really holding some people back. Retaining face masks in schools and businesses is damaging for young people's education and limiting Scotland's economy. So can I ask the First Minister? Her statement did not mention schools. When face masks are lifted on the 18th of April, will that include removing them entirely from schools, not just classrooms? And now that we have heard the third date that face masks will no longer be mandated in law, the First Minister has previously said the legal restriction would be lifted on the 21st of March, then early April, and now the 18th of April. Will the First Minister guarantee that there will be no further delays? First Minister. It seems to me, and it always has done, completely inconsistent uh, to rightly and understandably express concern about the pressure on our National Health Service and express concern about the high levels of infection on the one hand, but on the other hand bemoan the very limited protective measures that are still in place to help guide us through this. In terms of the pressure, in terms of the pressure on the National Health Service, it is very significant right now in, in all parts of the National Health Service, but particularly in our accident and emergency departments. Uh, we have set out in recent weeks uh, the range of different steps backed by significant investment that we are taking to support the National Health Service through the pandemic, uh, but also into uh, recovery. Uh, that is about investment. It is about continuing to increase the number of staff working in our National Health Service, but it is also about reforming the way care is delivered so that people get timely access to care in this, the places that they need it. But the, the most immediate and the most important thing we need to do to relieve pressure on our National Health Service is to get COVID cases yeah. down. We think that is now happening, and that is why I have set out uh, the statement that I have done today. Um, it is not the case to say that uh, legal measures are not in place in any other part of the UK. I was speaking to the First Minister of Wales uh, just yesterday, who have different legal protections in place than we have, but still have some legal protections in place. Um, and it is important uh, that we take a cautious uh, approach through this. Um, I, I think most people, and I, I do think uh, that the evidence, all of the evidence that I have seen on public opinion would suggest that Douglas Ross is just seriously out of step with the vast majority of people on this. 
People understand that face coverings, particularly in public places where people don't always have a choice uh, about being, people have to go to shops and therefore if we all wear face coverings in shops right now, we help to protect each other. For a couple of weeks more, while we see this wave of infection peak and start to fall, I think that is a sensible thing uh, to do. And I think the vast majority of people uh, agree with that. Um, and while nobody wants to be doing uh, that for longer uh, than necessary, I think most people accept that it is a sensible uh, precautionary measure to take. And lastly, on schools, uh, we would expect the uh, requirements in schools, uh, the remaining requirements in schools, to lift in line with the requirement for the general population. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the First Minister for an advance copy of her statement? The levels of COVID do remain concerning, not least due to the impact on the NHS. And whilst life is returning to near normality for many, that is not the case for those who are immunocompromised and the 180,000 people who were on the shielding list. So where is the detail about testing for them and their family carers beyond April? And what about access to antivirals? When will the First Minister set out plans to ensure that they and their carers are afforded assurance about what will happen to them in the future? And whilst on the subject of testing, can the First Minister advise whether testing in schools will end? I understand that the advice being considered will be for pupils to stay off if they have any symptoms without knowing whether it's a cold or COVID. Pupils and staff absence is already high, and this will cause disruption to their education at a time when the exams are starting. Given that very little has been done to improve ventilation in classrooms, will the First Minister reconsider and make sure that asymptomatic testing continues in schools for at least the next two months? Finally, Presiding Officer, I welcome the next stage of the vaccination programme, but we really should have learnt the lessons from before and not be sending my 80-year-old constituents from Helensburgh to Dunoon a 100-mile round trip on two ferries to get their booster. Hundreds of people have been sent these letters, giving them appointments many, many miles away from home, and told that even if they were to get an appointment locally, they may need to wait until the end of May, beginning of June. This is a problem with the National Vaccination Scheduling Service. Can the First Minister ensure that it's fixed? First Minister. Um, on, on the issue with vaccination in Argyll and Butte, uh, we have, and Argyll and Butte have apologised to those affected by what uh, was an error. My officials uh, met with Argyll and Butte Health and Social Care Partnership and NHS Highland to ensure that this problem uh, was rectified uh, as soon as it was identified and everyone affected will be contacted as soon as possible with a new appointment for the correct local vaccination clinic uh, to follow. Um, obviously, errors like this in a, a large-scale programme, when they happen, are deeply regrettable, but that does not take away from the massive success of this vaccination programme, which is the only thing right now uh, that is preventing all of us having to live with uh, much greater restrictions because it is helping protect uh, against serious illness. Um, on the wider questions on those with uh, compromised or suppressed immune systems, of course, uh, they are uh, being offered additional boosters. Uh, that is the first line of protection, and I set out uh, the broad timescale for that in my uh, statement. Uh, we will also, after uh, the population-wide uh, testing programme uh, ceases in its current form, uh, testing will be used to ensure that those who would benefit from antiviral treatment, and that is still uh, being offered on a, a fairly restricted basis, but will expand um, as more uh, antiviral treatments become available. Uh, but testing will be continued to use, uh, be used to ensure that those who uh, would benefit and are eligible for antivirals get speedy access uh, to that uh, treatment. And we will continue to ensure that we communicate with uh, those in uh, particular groups about the ongoing provision of testing. Some of the detail of this, of course, has already been set out in the testing strategy published, um, I think, two weeks ago uh, right now. And in terms of schools, we will continue uh, to develop uh, the school's guidance. Uh, it is not testing, of course, that is causing some uh, young people to be absent. It's high levels of infection, and it's important that we get infection levels down uh, so that we reduce the impact of the virus on schools as we want to reduce it 
in uh, broader society as well. So we continue, as we have done all along, uh, to take a balanced approach to the measures that are in place in schools. Uh, we will uh, continue to ensure targeted access to testing um, on the basis that is set out in the testing strategy. And of course, uh, if necessary, we will go beyond that as far as we can, uh, given the constraints on funding that I have set out previously in this chamber. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I too share Jackie Bailey's concerns about the paucity of detail around the removal of access to universal LFTs for free. A fortnight ago, I wrote to the First Minister regarding the cost of lateral flow tests after the 1st of May. The Scottish Government has moved in lockstep with the UK Government on testing, and that means an end to free lateral flow tests in almost all circumstances. They are already selling online. Thousands of people rely on LFTs to protect their loved ones from COVID, to protect people who they know are immunosuppressed and who spent months shielding. They understandably want to give them comfort and confidence. These people will be worried about the new cost of caring. It's nothing short of a visit your grand tax. Will the First Minister guarantee that all carers, NHS staff, care home staff and visitors have access to free COVID tests? And will she commit to creating a scheme to ensure free LFTs are available for those anxious to protect vulnerable loved ones? First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government is not in the same position on testing as the UK Government, as any uh, cursory look at the position uh, of the UK Government in testing right now would testify to. Uh, we are still supporting testing uh, in ways that is not uh, currently the case in the UK. We will continue to support uh, appropriate and targeted use of testing for the, the purposes set out in the testing strategy. And crucially, uh, where we are advising people to take tests, uh, we will not expect anyone to pay for those tests. We will continue to ensure access free of charge to testing. Uh, and of course, we will continue to have uh, discussions with those who are caring for people, those uh, visiting loved ones uh, in particular settings, to make sure uh, that there is appropriate access to testing as we move beyond the population-wide approach that we have taken uh, for the period up until now. Stephanie Callaghan to be followed by Sandesh Gulhani. Thank you, President Officer. Given the relentless pressures in NHS Lanarkshire acute care, with local hospitals currently operating beyond 100% capacity, can I ask the First Minister what more the Scottish Government can do to ensure the public is aware of the right place to access non-critical care services and that such provision is available? First Minister. Well, we continue to work with the health service in a range of ways to support uh, them through what is an exceptionally challenging uh, period. Uh, we're also taking steps to uh, ensure that the public is aware of the right place to access non-critical care needs and what provision is available. A number uh, of public awareness campaigns uh, have been run, including the general practice access campaign, uh, the right care, right place uh, campaign, the NHS 24 winter uh, campaign and the receptionist campaign, which aired in March uh, on television and radio, uh, focusing on the role of the receptionist as a navigator of, of care. So we will continue uh, as part of the broader efforts to reform how people access care in a way that is better for them uh, to ensure that this information is available while the NHS continues to uh, navigate through this incredibly difficult period. Sandesh Gulhani to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, I saw a woman in her 20s who subsequently died from ovarian cancer because she was too worried to present with her symptoms due to GPs being overwhelmed. We know that none of the health boards have met the 62-day standard for treating suspected cancer patients. And Macmillan Cancer have said that the cancer care system was struggling pre-pandemic and is now failing to cope despite the Herculean efforts of NHS staff. So my question is, what is the government doing now, and I, I stress now, to help save the lives of those who are facing delays for cancer treatment, as we know early diagnosis and timely treatment lead to better outcomes? And the money you have already announced has not solved this problem. First Minister. Um, Cancer care has continued rightly to be a priority throughout the pandemic and it, it continues to be so. The 31-day uh, uh, cancer treatment target uh, has been met consistently, the 62-day target that is a, a real focus on ensuring uh, that that is met. Of course, median uh, waiting times for access to treatment are uh, very short, um, but uh, we 
recognise the importance of doing more around early detection of cancer, which is why the Detect Cancer Early uh, campaign uh, has the investment and the support that it does. Uh, the new early diagnostic centres uh, that I have spoken about previously in the Chamber are also being developed. So this is a really important area uh, of care. And I would want to end uh, this answer with a very strong message to anybody who has symptoms uh, indicative of cancer um, or anybody who has symptoms uh, causing a concern that they might have cancer to seek uh, medical attention urgently uh, and to contact uh, their GP. Cancer uh, is and will continue to be a clinical priority in the National Health Service. John Mason to be followed <coughs> by Paul O'Kane. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have to confess that the 2,300 uh, people in hospital does concern me quite a lot and concerns quite a lot of other people. Is the First Minister confident that these numbers are going to reduce without us having further restrictions in place? First Minister. Well, the, the number in hospital is obviously a concern uh, to, to me and to the Health Secretary, to the Government, which is why I think it is important that we continue to exercise a degree of caution. Uh, what we know um, from uh, the, the, the journey of this infection, any infection, but what we also know from experience through COVID is that as we start to see case numbers uh, come down, as we are hopefully now beginning to see with this latest wave of infection, uh, we will start to see the pressure on hospitals uh, ease as well. And obviously we are keen to see that happen as quickly as possible. There is some early indication in the hospital admission figures uh, that we're starting to see that slight easing of pressure, but we want to see that intensify in the days and weeks to come. Um, it is the case, of course, that vaccination is uh, providing significant protection against serious illness. The hospital numbers that we are seeing right now, although they are putting a severe pressure on the health service, would be much, much higher but for vaccination. And because of vaccination, uh, the numbers uh, needing intensive care are lower uh, than they have been at previous stages of the pandemic. Um, so I am not complacent. None of us should be complacent about the pressure on our National Health Service. But we know if we see uh, case numbers fall and if this wave has peaked, we will start to see that uh, become more pronounced in the days ahead, then we will start to see uh, sometime, some days after that the pressure on our NHS ease as well. Paul O'Kane to be followed by Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Our hospitals are under immense pressure um, and any waiting times are shocking. Care at home and residential care services are also under immense pressure and schools are having to temporarily close in some parts of the country. Staffing shortages, already high, are being exacerbated by COVID-related absences. And as a consequence, people who need support are often falling through the gaps and staff are struggling to keep things going. These are older people who need care and young people who are preparing for exams. So what urgent additional support will the First Minister provide to support services in desperate need? And can she also clarify the government's plans for self-isolation and testing as we move forward into the spring and summer period? First Minister. Um, the Education Secretary has previously set out uh, support uh, for young people studying for exams. Uh, of course, we continue to engage with COSLA in terms of support uh, that local authorities are providing uh, for social care uh, services. The future approach to testing and self-isolation has been set out in the testing strategy. We will continue to advise people um, right now who test positive and after that who have uh, symptoms of COVID to isolate. I, I think that is the responsible thing for all of us to do. Um, one of the biggest challenges, um, even after vaccination, given the protection against serious illness, of case rates as high as they are right now, are the absences that are caused, uh, staff absences that are caused across uh, key and critical services. Um, and the way to ease that is to get case numbers down, uh, which is why we continue to take the cautious approach uh, that we are and why we are optimistic that we are starting to see that corner being turned uh, so that that pressure, uh, along with the other pressures in the NHS, will ease in the days ahead. Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. People who are vaccinated are less likely to develop long COVID, even if they catch the virus. A rapid review by the UK Health Security Agency suggests. So, would the First Minister therefore encourage anyone who hasn't yet had the vaccine to come forward and do so? First Minister. Uh, yes, I would very strongly give that encouragement. Uh, the study referred to underlines the benefits of receiving a full course of COVID vaccination. It is the best way of protecting ourselves from serious symptoms uh, when we get infected, and it might also help to reduce any longer-term impact. We know that vaccination 
has been the most effective tool that we've had against the virus, and that is going to continue to be the case. So if you haven't come forward for your first, second, third uh, dose yet, it's not too late. Please uh, make sure you contact the helpline or get in touch with your uh, doctor in order to get the vaccination uh, as quickly as possible. It is not too late to be vaccinated, so please don't feel embarrassed about coming forward now. Uh, you could be giving yourself and your loved ones vital protection. Julie Mackay, to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. For some, face cover coverings are an inconvenience. However, for some, they are the difference between going about their lives safely and contracting a serious illness. Face coverings reduce risk and they provide an extra layer of protection to people who are vulnerable to the virus, many of whom will be concerned about the decision to convert the legal requirement into guidance. Has the Scottish Government consulted with disabled people's organisations about the impact this decision will have on people who are clinically vulnerable? First Minister. We will continue to engage uh, with a range of groups in the population about all of these decisions. It is the, the case, and I have uh, laid this out in the Chamber many times before, that with any legal restriction, uh, we have to uh, be uh, sure that we are acting lawfully, and that means we must make an assessment about the proportionality of keeping any measure in law, and that applies to the face covering uh, measure as it uh, did previously to all others. So these are decisions uh, that we have to balance carefully. But Jilly Mackay is right, um, I think, in terms of uh, the, the broad balance of public opinion around face coverings. I, I have to say, I get many more contacts from people worried um, about the uh, the requirement to wear a face covering no longer being in law than I get from people who are annoyed about having to wear face coverings. I accept that nobody uh, wants to, to have to do anything like this if it's not necessary. But I think the vast majority of people uh, recognise that wearing a face covering, if it helps provide some protection to others, particularly those who are most clinically vulnerable to this virus, uh, then it's something, particularly after all of the sacrifice and the heartache of the past uh, couple of years, then being asked to do that for a couple more weeks, I think is something the vast majority of people uh, accept, whether or not they, they like it. So I think these decisions have to be taken carefully, um, and we will seek to do that as far as we possibly can. Christine Graham, to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you very much, President. They're following much on the same string. Does the First Minister agree with me that Douglas Ross should remember that we wear face coverings not just for ourselves, but mainly to protect the stranger next to us on the bus, in the supermarket, who may be undergoing, for example, cancer treatment, is immune deficient, you don't know that, and they need us to wear our mask so they can at least go out and shop. Before, First, First Minister, before you respond, can I just point out that the issues that me members are encouraged to ask questions raised by the First Minister in her statement. Um, thank you. First Minister, very briefly, because we're very tight for time. Uh, I think we should possibly all remember the, the sort of wall of you know, abuse that's coming from uh, that section of the chamber. We, are, we might have disagreements here, but we're dealing with a pandemic of an infectious virus, and perhaps we could try to deal with these issues in a more civilised way than some right now uh, are demonstrating um, in this chamber. Uh, Christine Graham is right. The wearing of a face covering is about giving other people protection. And when you're in a supermarket, you don't know who might be uh, close by who is more clinically vulnerable to this virus. And while infection levels are as high as they are right now, and we hope they will reduce in the days and weeks to come, but while they're as high as they are right now, if wearing a face covering in a supermarket, for example, might be reducing the risk of passing the virus to somebody who, if they did get it, would become or would be at risk of becoming seriously unwell, then I think that's a price most of us uh, are willing to pay at this stage of the pandemic. Call Murdo Fraser to be followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given everything the First Minister has just said, why wasn't she wearing a face mask yesterday? Yeah. First Minister. I abided by uh, the rules in place there. I wore uh, a face covering uh, on the train to London and the train back uh, from London. I abide by the rules. Um, and I know that's something that perhaps the Conservatives struggle to understand. Uh, but I abide by the rules. And Rona Mackay. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. With news reports suggesting the Met Police is about to issue fines. I, I'd be very grateful if we could hear Ms Mackay. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. With news reports suggesting the Met Police is about to issue fines to at least 20 officials who breached COVID restrictions by attending parties uh, held at Downing Street, 
Is the First Minister concerned that these events in Westminster potentially undermine public health messaging here in Scotland? Again, First, First Minister, uh, I appreciate that the issue touches on COVID. It may be the view of the member that that is the case. However, these are questions to do with issues raised in the First Minister's statement. First Minister, very briefly. Well, look, I do believe that it is important to continue to take uh, balanced judgments. Uh, I hope we're getting to a point where all of this is behind us. But right now, while levels of infection are as high, uh, my job, my duty is to take decisions that are right uh, for the people of Scotland. That's what I'm going to continue uh, to do. Um, no doubt that will meet a wall of criticism, whatever I do uh, from the Conservative benches. But my job, my duty is to do right by the people of Scotland. And that's what I'll always seek to do. Thank you. That concludes the First Minister's statement on COVID-19 update. There will be a brief pause before the next item.